Welcome to the crossroads of the known and the unknown. This is AJ Paz, Spiritual Journalist Podcast. We are here with Reverend Norma Edwards, and she had one of the earliest near-death experiences I've heard about. This was in the 1960s. 60s. And since then, you have had a very spiritual life, and you have helped a lot of people. But I would like to know, first of all, uh, the details about your experience, and then we can talk about its consequences. Yeah. I understand that you were living in London. You are from Guyana, but you were living in London at the time. Is this so? Yes, that's so. That was so. I was married, got married at 19, left my husband and I, and we went to England to seek the education. And um, we spent 10, 12 years in England. And um, then we returned home, back to Guyana to give back. You know, that, that concept that says, so you, you got educated, you left, you got educated. We came back when Guyana became an independent nation. And we gave ten years. Um, but you had your you had your near death experience before returning. Yes, I had my near death experience in 1966, St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. Okay, this was way before Raymond Moody wrote his book. Oh yes, and uh, not many people at the time uh, told or talked about these experiences, and they had no name. So. Can you tell us, please, what happened that day at the hospital? Okay. It was a, a Monday morning. The day started. It's important for me to start when the day started. The day started on a Monday morning. I'm not feeling quite well, and I've been off from work on sick leave, and I have to return, even though I'm not feeling well that day. So I had one child at the time, dressed him, dropped him off at the caretaker, and made my way into work. I got into work and during the day, the pain I was experiencing in my stomach increased. And at about four o'clock, you know, you're a woman, I'm looking at the time because I'm scheduled to get off work at five. But around four o'clock, it dawned on me that the pain I was experiencing felt like labor pains. And um, I asked if I could be allowed to leave. So I left, I left work, I entered the elevator and there was one other person in the elevator and she was a Hindu woman and she was dressed in her Hindu outfit and the red dot on her forehead. And in those days, the elevators, they ended with a jerk, you know? And when that elevator stopped with that jerk, all hell broke loose inside of me. I mean, pain, excruciating pain, and I collapsed. And the young lady being um, very astute, um, she opened the elevator door and she cried for help. And since the hospital was like blocks away, she hailed a cab. And they got me into the cab and they got me to the hospital. Now, when I got to the hospital, the cab driver uh, drove away with my handbag and he brought it back the next day. But in my handbag was all my information, you see. So here is this poor young woman at, a, at an emergency room with me, with, with me and, and, and they say, well, what's her name? And she says, she said her name is Norma. That's all she knew. Who is she? Where did she live? She knew nothing about me. The amazing thing was she stayed. She stayed the entire night. And I was rushed into surgery. And at some point, I kind of regained semi-consciousness for a little while. And, and there are two doctors rushing with, a, a, with me on a trolley to get me into um, the operating room. And um, they said to me, you've got a dead fetus inside of you that has been poisoning the body. And then I, I pass out again. And the next thing I experience is... I am feeling absolutely comfortable, blissful, no pain. All the pain is gone. And I am on the ceiling looking down at my body on an operating room. You talk about <laughs> being crazed. I'm like, how can I be in two places 
at the same time. Because I'm watching the doctors and it, it is very clear to me that they're really concerned that they got an emergency situation here. And and I'm on the ceiling looking down, pain is gone. And, and I want to, to, to let them know that everything is all right. So I begin to think, how do I get off of this ceiling? And I guess that's the first lesson I learned how powerful our thoughts are. As soon as I said, thought, how can I get off the ceiling? I was on the ground. And I'm running from one doctor to the other saying, hello, this is me. I don't understand what's happening here, but um, I'm okay. And then it occurred to me, they can't see me. So again, and, and this speaks to how well we can process when we're on the other side. The thought in my head now says, well, now there are two nurses here. Women are more intuitive. Maybe they'll be able to see me. So I rush over to the two nurses and I'm running between them and they can't see me either. And then I stop and I watch the equipment flatline. Now I knew what that meant because I had friends and family members who were nurses. And I'm like, this can't be right. The equipment must be on the malfunctioning. <laughs> I got to get out of here before they kill me accidentally. Because I watched the doctors pick up the, I call it the um, the fibrillators. But yeah, the paddles. 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 Yeah, I call it paddles. I watched them pick up the paddles. And for some reason, I could see how much electricity it carried. And the thought in my head said, I got to get out of here. This equipment is malfunctioning and they might very well kill me with all that electricity. And with that thought, I went straight out the roof. And now I'm in a very, very dark tunnel. And when I say dark, darker than anything you can imagine here. But the most amazing thing is I'm not afraid. And I'm traveling through this tunnel, it seems almost at the speed of lightning. <laughs> And eventually I come around the corner. And when I come around the corner, I could see the exit to the tunnel. And at first what I'm looking at is like, you know how we see rainbows and arc, the arc and the rainbows and the colors, except there were more colors in that rainbow than I'd ever seen. And as I got closer, the kaleidoscope of light shifted. And now I'm looking at crystal clear, white light and the thought in my head now is if i go through that light i will probably damage the corona in my eyes because the light was so brilliant and then i merged and that moment when i merge there are no words aj to describe the joy the bliss the love i was i became love in merging with the light, I became love. And it, it, it's, there really are no words in any language to describe the experience, the feeling. Can, you, can I ask you a, a few questions? Yes. Because I had an experience, it was like a near-death-like experience. I did not die, but I went through that dark place. I merged with the light. Okay. And I could see up down to the right to the left to every direction at the same time yeah, simultaneously multi multi-dimensional did you feel that yes i did i could also feel the center of the light it was like a star or a sun you know i could yes. uh, there was a center i could focus on the center and i could focus in all directions in each ray mm -hmm. And also, I could focus on the space surrounding each ray, the empty space. So it was full of light, but there was also a space. And I could see the center and also any part of the ray. And it seemed that it was infinite. Each ray in all directions at the same time. I could not think of myself. I could not think, I could, did not remember I was human. I was that. So continue, please. Is that more or less what you felt? No, thank you very much for sharing that because I have always said words cannot describe. 
the depth of what I saw, but you described what I could not put in words. Wow, amazing. Thank you. Continue, oh, please. This, this, is, this is a moment. This, is, this, is, this really is a moment because I could not put it into words the way you put it into words. It was like too much. Yes, it was too much. I was, was too much. This happened 30 years ago, and uh, I can tell you about what happened later. But this really transformed my life. It was yes. really shocking and confusing at first. Yes. But continue, please. Yes. So now I'm on the other side, and um, <clears throat> I have become a part of this light, the light that you're talking about. And the thought in my head again comes, how does one get around in this environment? And as soon as I ask that question, I'm moving. I'm moving again at the speed of light. And I come to an area where there is a huge television screen. Even today, we haven't built television screens that big. <laughs> and I stop at the screen and the, the light gets reflected onto the screen and it begins to scroll. And I'm now watching on this screen the lifetime, the 26 years of life that I just left. And I could see childhood. I could see childhood experiences. When I was a child, I had a whole lot of questions about the Bible. I'd, like, I'd go to church on Sunday, and my mother would say, when you get there, close your eyes. Don't ask any questions, because invariably, I'd end up with questions. So I'm reviewing the 26 years of life that I have lived. And I um, it was not at all judgmental. There was no judgment. Uh, I'm looking at it really with, 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 with humor, with amusement, because the screen lit up and it divided into three sections. On the left-hand side was my life as I had planned it before I became embodied. In the middle column was my life as I lived it. And it kind of came up from birth to three, from three to nine. And I'm looking at all these experiences and it's like watching television. And then in the, in the third column, there was a stamp that says, objective not accomplished. And then we go back to the left-hand side again. Now, now I'm looking at, let's say, maybe the period between 9 and 15. And I'm looking at all the experiences. And it, none of those experiences were bad. They weren't negative. It's just that that's not what I had planned. <laughs> if you see what I mean. And I'm observing it, and again, we come to the middle, and in the middle, I'm, I'm observing how I have lived it, what I was thinking, where my head was at. Um, and then I come to the, the final column, and again, it looked as though someone had created a stamp. And the stamp said, objective not accomplished. Objective not accomplished. And now I am feeling very silly, because I'm thinking, how could I have been such a fool to have lived 26 years and not um, engaged the, 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 the plan that I had made. So I'm now laughing now at myself and going, well, that was really silly, Norma. I mean, now, now what next? Now, as soon as I said that, the screen stopped moving. And the thought in my head at that point was a question that I could not get answered from any of the pastors in any every church I went into, I had a question for the pastor. But the one that I could never get an answer for was this one. And Christ said, I came so you can have life and have it more abundantly. And then at nine years of age, I'm saying to my parents and my grandparents, but Christ himself died. And everyone has been dying since. What did he mean by that? And that's when my mother made me to know, stop asking questions, because I was asking questions nobody could answer. And I'm standing there now, and this question reappears in my mind. What did Christ mean when he said that? And now I'm transported very quickly to now what looks like a Colosseum with those big pillars 
at a hugeness, as my granddaughter would say, <laughs> the screen between the pillars. And it begins to scream, begins to scroll. And as it begins to scroll, I am watching the merge of the lifetime I just lived into seven other lifetimes. And I'm watching now why it is that I chose certain experiences, what I was supposed to learn from it, and what I didn't learn from it because I did not follow the plan. <laughs> the very first lifetime that came up on the screen, and it comes up on the screen, and then at a certain point, I watched the merge with the lifetime that I left. And the very first one um, was, um, I was a, uh, it was way, way, way back in, in, in some century back there, when for some reason there was a light on the planet Earth and everybody walked around with um, torches. Very, 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 very ancient. And um, we were being transported, a number of us women and children, we were walking through um, a cave and when we got out of the cave, we were on the seashore. And there was war in this community. One community was warring with the other. But when I say war, not with guns, but rather with, with very ancient tools. And they had gathered us, 23 women, and I think it was 10 children, and got us to the, to the, to the, to the ocean. And when we got there, we realized there were these boats there and there were other groups. And what they were intended, what they did was put women and children in these boats with whatever food they had and push the boats out to sea in the hope, since they were losing the war, that we would survive and, and, and be able to revitalize the community, you see. The boat I was in, there were 23 women and 10 children. The boat capsized. And one of the things I learned from there is that fear I was still carrying the fear because you're standing there and you're looking at the scrolling going on, but you also have the feelings. You could feel, you could feel the scramble for breath. You could feel the scramble. I mean, you can experience it. And we all died. Was this in, in prehistoric times? Yes. Okay. We all died, but... I'm left with this, I'm just observing, I'm left with the fear, the actual fear of what it felt like to be a child drowning in the ocean. And then the screen moved, the, the screen moved, and when it's been moved now, now again, I'm in prehistoric time, but I'm a male and I'm a warrior. And I, we're at war. And, and I'm a warrior and I'm, I'm doing, I'm feeling what it feels like to kill or be killed. You don't have time to stop and wonder about whether what you're doing is right or wrong. It's, it's, it's either they kill you or you kill them. So I, I kind of like got away from their understanding that. But you know, it, it's easy to kind of point fingers where well, you should not go kill people. But when it's my life or yours, it's a different story. So I experienced that. And then um, from there now, I moved the screen, screen started moving again. And from there again, fear walking away with fear um and from that 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 scene now i moved it so i guess a little bit more of modern times if you would call it that because i am at the i'm watching moses being pulled out of the bulrushes and i'm one of the women at the water side when wow amazing and the the, the fear in our hearts that we have no business. Jews have nothing to do with the Samaritans. Now, it was very interesting because my mother repeated that statement a lot when I was growing up. The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And here am I looking at what that meant. Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You don't rescue no Jewish child. Why are you rescuing? You see what I'm saying? And there's all this fear again, fear, fear of what the outcome of rescuing this baby uh, could, could, could mean to us as women. Because as women, we have no rights, really. So then I experienced that. And then um, I moved from there to Paul. 
first of all, no, before that, I moved to the crucifixion. I, I, I'm there. And um, Paul is there. Who was there? Paul. Oh. Paul witnessed the crucifixion. I don't know why it's not in the Bible. He was there to make sure that it happened. Are you, were you one of the Jesus' followers? Well, let, 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 me, let me move on and you will see. And um, and uh, so I'm there and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm observing Paul. I'm observing Paul very closely. Uh, it's like my, my attention is not even so much on crucifixion, it's on Paul. Okay? And it, it, and the whole the whole of his being is he, he needs to be there to make sure that what needs to be done gets done. So when this is over, they're not going to take a living man off of that cross. It's going to be a dead man. But my attention is on Paul. And then the next place I find myself now is Paul being knocked off of a horse when God wanted to speak to him. You also witnessed that. Yes. And and I'm I'm observing that. And I'm observing that. And um very interesting. Very interesting. And you know, he could not speak and what have you. And 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 I'm kind of like following him. It's like I was following him, observing what he was experiencing until he began the whole thing of 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 bringing bringing people to to um to Christ. And then I, I, I leave there now. And the next experience is I'm a child with my mother in the cotton fields of where I live now. And we're picking cotton. And it's in rows. And I can hear in the row before us I can hear the hooves of the horses. I can always, I can also hear the sound of the whip when it hits the back of the slave. And I know as a child that that happens because the slave cannot keep up with their uh, the portion that they need to accomplish. And there's absolute terrifying fear inside of me because I'm a child. I cannot make that, I can't make the, the, the allotment. And I know that when the mass man horse come around, I will feel that whip on my back. And this then I was, jumped so, from there and jumped a, from there. Okay. To the this next was in Guyana? This, is, this, this was in the South, South Carolina where I live now. Oh, okay. South Carolina. South Carolina okay. where I live now. Please continue. And it's a spirit that brought me to South Carolina. And, and then suddenly now the scene changes. And I'm in the next lifetime. And I am the white mass man on the horse. Wielding that whip. You got to stop the nonsense about who's guilty and who's not. <laughs> we really do. Wow. And that was the end of my time at the Akashic Record. See, at the time, I did not know I was at the Akashic Record. The Akashic Record is a record that stores everything that has ever happened in the history of the worlds. I did not know that I was at the Akashic Record. Much, much later, I got that information in a download after I came back, that that's where I had been taken. So now I'm like, oh my God, how can you? You see, I started off the journey. How could I be in two places at the same time? Now I'm really confused. How can I be in different <laughs> pieces of history <laughs> and watching it at the same time? So the scroll, the screen closes, and I ask the question, what next? And again, I'm moving again like a speed, speed of lightning. My feet doesn't touch the ground. I'm just moving, and I come to a river. You know, where we sing in the Christian tradition, yes, we will gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river, 
gather with the saints at the river. I went to the river. And on the other side, the other bank of the river, I was 300 and something souls standing there greeting me. And you talk about love. I have no words to describe that level of love. And they were just beaming love to me with hands outstretched. And they're, they're just beaming and I'm experiencing and feeling this love. And I know that I know each and every one of them, that I've even lived with them in a, in a lifetime before. I've interacted with them in a lifetime and they have come to welcome me. And then my aunt, who was the, 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 the last person to have died in, in my lifetime, and I was very close to my aunt. I was, if you read the book, my, my mother and my aunt raised me. And um, she started to step forth in the water to come towards me. And I began to do the same thing. So we're, wading, we're wading in the water, coming to greet each other. And I'm so excited because I'm so full of all this beautiful, amazing love. And just as she gets close enough to touch me, she steps back and she says, I'm so sorry. They're not allowing you to say. And I say, why? And she says, well, no, they're sending you back with a message. And I said, well, hello. There are millions of people back there. <laughs> I'm sure they could find someone. They seem to be able to do magic here. I'm sure they can find someone back there and give them the message. And she said, no, they're sending you back with the message. There is more to life than meets the eye. Life is eternal. And with that, I found myself moving at the speed of light. And I'm moving in this light and this beautiful love. And, and then I got slammed into my physical body, lying in the hospital bed. And I was not a happy camper, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> it seems as though I was four. You see, when we're traveling in our spirit, it's huge. Your spirit is huge. It's a huge collection of energy. When you take that huge collection of energy, you try to slam it into that body, I'm telling you, that was painful, anesthesia or not. <laughs> it was a horrible experience to move from this crescendo of beautiful love and light to be rammed into a body. Um, and I was not happy at all. And the journey of readjustment began. So now I am in a, in a, in a little room and there's two nurses that are sitting there at the table. And I guess they're observing me, you know, after the, after the operation. And I've got all these tubes in and out of me. And it's two young women are sitting. It's, it's late at night. They're sitting at this table. And it seems as though they're friends. They're nurses. And they both belong to the same church. Now, I had my near-death experience on a Monday. And on a Sunday, one of them went to church because she was off and the other one had to work. So the one who went to church is now summarizing the sermon, the Sunday sermon, to her friend. And the sermon had a lot to do with hell. And I'm lying in this bed and I'm like, what in the world? I can't believe that a pastor would get on a pulpit and preach about hell. There is no hell. But I can't speak because I've got tubes in my throat, you see. So I'm frustrated. And she's explaining this and, and, and I'm going, but, but, but that's not true. That's not the way the word is. And then suddenly it dawned on me, wait a minute, Norma. You woke up this morning and you believed that crap. What happened to you that now, not only do I believe it, but I'm willing to rip all this stuff out of my throat so I can defend it. And I'm like, wow, what happened? What happened, Norma? Now, two men, and of course I tell myself, well, maybe it's because they're females. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So two male, two male, I don't know, they, they had on white coats. I don't know if they were doctors or whatever. They come walking along the corridor and they stop to talk to these two young ladies, you see. 
<laughs> and I'm like, but they believe the same thing. How could that be? You see, the transformation, it's almost like they lift what you have in your memory bank. They transformed it and they put it back in. And now I'm thinking, oh my God, they're two men and they believe it too. So um, after I finished describing the sermon, they turned on a little transistor radio they had on the table. Now I'm about to be really confused. Uh, the, the 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 radio um, had classical music coming out of it. Only now I could see the notes. Every note has a color. Every color is tied to a mathematical symbol. I, I, and I'm just in awe. And I'm watching them breathe this information in. And I'm watching how the colors are affecting the interior of their bodies. And I'm thinking, what in the world has happened to me? So um, finally, you know, I got strength enough and they put me in a ward. You know, in those days, they put you in a ward with eight or 10 people with beds. And it's like two o'clock in the morning and, and, and I really need some sleep here. And when they reel me in, there's a woman in the bed and she's crying out. Oh my God, she thinks she's going to die. And she's crying out for her mother. She's crying out for Jesus. She's crying out for Mother Mary. And she's just keeping everybody awake. And I wanted to sleep. So I pushed myself up on my elbows and I said, ma'am, you have 10 more years to live. You're not going to die. <laughs> how and did then, you know that? I asked myself, well, how, do I, how did I know that? Because you see, a whole file has opened up inside of me. But she took me seriously. She went to sleep and we got some sleep. <laughs> so then um, one of the nurses came and I said, how did I know that? I said, well, it was just there to know. Didn't you know it? You know, because now I have to adjust to this amazing transformation that has taken place inside of my life. So um, <laughs> it, it, it was just very confusing. The day my husband came to take me home, as we stepped out of the hospital, uh, it was winter. And so the trees had no leaves. But I stepped out and I'm standing there and I'm watching the activity going on in the trunk, inside of the trunk of the trees. How it's pulling the energy up from the earth and bringing it all the way up to the top to disperse it into the universe. And I'm standing there with my mouth open like, how come I never saw this before? It was, it was quite, quite an experience. And I entered the physical world now with very heightened um, senses. The five senses got extremely heightened. I could see, I could see spirits. I could, I could see into the human body. That, that was really something. And I wanted to scream at people, you know, you have a, a, a tumor in there and you need, as a matter of fact, there was one nurse in the hospital who I could see the tumor inside of her. And I thought, you're running around here trying to get people well, and you're not aware that you have a tumor because I could see it, you see. So the journey began, and, and one of the things that we, we now, as soon as I walk under a bulb, it will blow because my frequency has gotten to a place. So we're buying light bulbs by the dozen. <laughs> Uh, it, it was very confusing, very exciting some of the time. And then the day when I had to return to the hospital, you know, you have to return for a checkup. We got to the hospital, my husband and I, and um, we stopped at the crossing, you know what I mean, to cross the street. And a car comes around and the woman standing in front of me, I, I will never, I've never been able to figure out whether she willfully stepped into the, the, the field of the car so that she got hit or whether or not she collapsed. But the next thing I know, she's down on the ground. And she's down on the ground and I'm watching her spiritual body leaving the physical body. And I'm, oh. I'm, I'm directing to her. So now, now you'll get there. 
that was what you call my very first crossing with somebody. I said, now when you get there, you're going to go through a tunnel. Do not be. Now people are looking at me like I'm crazy, you know, because everybody has kind of rushed to her, to her attention on the ground, but I'm not. I'm standing there and I'm talking and I'm saying to her, now you're going to go through a tunnel. It's going to be all right. After the tunnel, you're going to go through the light. You're going to get into the light. When you get to the light, you're okay. And then I look around and people are looking at me like I'm nuts. And I think that was the moment when I decided I'm going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Walked her right out into the light. And um, my husband at the time, who's now my ex-husband, he couldn't handle it at all. And I think when he began to say, he began to say to me, what did they do to you in that hospital? Maybe they gave you the wrong medication. Maybe he was looking for physical reasons why. I had changed to the point that I had. See what I'm saying? So, so this was not something that happened only a few days. This went on? It went on until I had to, I've had to eight spiritual teachers so that I can adjust to living with it. Are you still able to do those things or do they continue happening? For example, Let me put it this way. When I found my life purpose, I was able to focus all of that energy on that. And finding my life purpose took me into prisons to work with um, with men in prisons who needed their lives readjusting, many of whom were addicts and the freedom of addiction. Once I got into what my purpose for life was, it wasn't as chaotic. You see what I'm saying? Because now all of that, kind of got drawn together and I could focus it on my life's purpose. Does that make sense? But yes. it was a journey and it took eight spiritual teachers. The first the first um, two was we were in London at the time and um, we joined this church. It was an Episcopal church. And the pastor and his wife kind of, we, we had no family in England took us under there, under their wing. And he began to teach me seriously about sacredness, what it means to carry sacredness, because he sensed that, you know. Um, so those were the first two teachers, and they taught me about divinity and sacredness. That, you know, your soul is sacred, and there's a piece of that your soul that you're carrying uh, inside of you. And um, yes, it was, was quite interesting, but it took eight spiritual teachers. And it did not come, I did not seek them out, they sought me. Were they from different religions or were they all Christian? Oh yes, I studied the Buddhist religion very deeply to be able to understand what was happening with me. Christianity doesn't have all the answers, but that's because they don't want all the answers. They kind of like where they are. I say it's the beginning stages of your spiritual journey. What is your present belief regarding religion and spirituality? What would you say? Religion is, you know, when you start your education, they send you to kindergarten. You know that if you want to become a doctor, you're going to have to get out of kindergarten. <laughs> you're going to have to learn a whole lot of stuff before they give you that doctorate. Am I explaining it well? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm an ordained minister. I'm also an ordained priest. I am still a Christian because people still need, kids still need to go to kindergarten to learn what they have to learn before they can become a doctor or a scientist. Right. You can't close down kindergarten or first grade and expect that they're going to excel in college. Yeah. Um, there's a question that people make. You saw, so you saw uh, Jesus. What did Jesus look like? Does he, was he similar to what people, how people depict him? No, it's not. Okay. No, it's no, it's not. we depicted based on on our belief system and our consciousness of where we are consciously. See what I'm saying? But no, it's not. And, and does he, he look, he, he I don't him like a like a European, you know. Let's he, put it this way. If you were born and raised in an area where the, the, the temperature is in the hundred, 
degrees, what do you think you'd look like? Right, dark skinned and not blue eyes and, you know, certain traits that uh, the, the, the commercial Jesus does not have, you know. He, you see, it's not only the commercial Jesus. We need to understand that, and we have the same ability except we're not pursuing developing it. When you get to a certain level of energetic level, you can manifest however you want to manifest so that people can get it. It's no different than me manifesting in this lifetime as black. But in a lifetime before, I was not black. You see what I'm saying? So there may be no doubt that Christ, during his time on the earth, chose to manifest in places where it was the best for him to be accepted. It's like, think of God. We think of God. Some people think of God as a man. Some people think of God in many, many ways, don't we? But when God wanted to talk to Moses, how did he manifest? It was a burning bush. So we get all hung up in, well, in, in this lifetime. I am normal. I'm a woman. I am black. I come from, from South America. That's important in, Amer in, 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 in the life that we're living now. It doesn't have any importance over there. And let me blow your mind now. As normal, I'm talking to you here now as normal. Um, I'm also simultaneously doing some work on the eighth dimension with music. It's part of me that's doing that right now. There's a part of me that is on the seventh dimension helping someone to get through that barrier. We are multidimensional beings. When we are here, we are in school. Think about your life. When you went to college, college was not the only thing you were doing. You were going home to go forget your mother's cooking or your grandmother's cooking. You were going to football games. You weren't in the classroom all the time. Make sense? We're multidimensional beings. Yes, interesting. And we're manifesting all of the time. So uh, to wrap this up regarding... Uh, death and your death experiences what would you say to someone who is uh, afraid that uh, for example they may have a terminal disease or a relative may have recently died or is about to die what would you tell them or what have you learned about death well it's interesting you ask that question my husband and I do volunteer service in a senior community. And there are 350 something seniors there. And we go on a Sunday and we provide a um, little service. And what I say to them is, every morning you wake up, you give thanks for the fact that you've got the most valuable thing in the whole world, your breath. And as long as you've got your breath, you are required to find some joy in the fact that the creator, whether he be man, woman, child, whatever, has chosen to pass his breath through you and you rejoice. And you give thanks for every day that you live and you look for the lesson. What did you learn today? Did you give a smile to someone? Did you pass on this love that you've got? Because when you do that, you feel a certain amount of joy. And when the time comes for you to leave, know that there is no death. You're just leaving the physical body behind so you can go live a more expanded spiritual life on the other side. And so we have Seniors laughing and smiling and reminiscing and listening to music. What about the prisoners you say you visited? Did, did they oh react the god. same way? Oh my god, 27 years. 27 years of my life. And I became the very first uh, 
government contractor to take spiritual concepts and put it into clinical practice so that men and women who really needed to be released uh, from what was holding them and um, thousands, hundreds of 27 years and um, turned cell block into something very different. When I first walked on, they first walked me on to cell block as a volunteer. I walked away. I came out and I said to, to, to my guide, I said, I can't do this. This is impossible. And, and the answer was, who's asking you to do it? We're only asking you to be there. <laughs> and then watched hundreds of men and women transform their lives. What would that screen say today? Objective not accomplished? I am objective hoping. Not I'm hoping. I still believe in prayer. I am hoping on that screen I will not be sent back. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> well, thank you, Norma. This was a real pleasure. Your story is amazing. I I am really glad to have you here. And I, I do want to continue talking, you know, and uh, having discussions about these topics. You have a, a monthly meeting. Yes. Uh, I went to that meeting um, a few days ago. Would you like to invite people who are interested in learning more about you to attend these meetings? And when, yes. when, when do you celebrate them? It's the second Saturday in every month. So it's easy to remember. You can circle it on your calendar, the second Saturday of every month, and we call it the circle. And it it, it was given to me um, from the other side, and it was given to me with these words, the circle has no beginning, it has no ending. To help us to understand that life didn't have a beginning, it doesn't have an ending. When we leave school, much the same like here on the earth, we were. when we leave school, we go out into the working world, do we? Leaving school doesn't mean our life is over. Earth is a school, when we understand that. When we leave here, we go on to service at much higher levels. You also wrote a book. Uh, yes. Awakening. You... Awakening, that's, that's the name. the name of the book. And I would advise you to read it because you'll get a lot of humor and joy out of that. I started off first with the way what my background and my life was. I wanted people to know that, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't born in some rich family or what have you, you know, normal person. And then there's a near death experience. And then I kind of carry a chronicle of where that near death experience has led me to the places, to the things, to the human beings, to the, um, I, I, I've be just been blessed that the universe sent me people to keep me sane because at first, initially I really thought I was going crazy. Uh, and, and then the universe sent me people and souls who helped me to see there's a purpose for this and you have to understand the sacredness. I had to put serious discipline into my life and what I think I'd like to leave with your listeners is this fact that my sp I had to I had to open up myself. I had to reawaken, and I have to begin. I had to begin the journey of spirituality. But I did that while I was married and raising a family. I have five children, eight grandchildren, so that I couldn't afford an hour to, to meditate. I didn't have an hour at a time to meditate. But I was guided by my guides on the other side on how to do this. Like, for example, you have to put um, you have to put um, discipline in place. You have to get the body fit. So they would make me park the car four blocks away from where I'm going so that I can get that opportunity to get the rhythm and the walking in. So what I'm teaching people now, I also carry cast, is what I'm teaching people now. I don't tell you how to live your spiritual life, but I just give hints from my own life on how to develop the discipline, how to expand the frequency of the energy. And then from there, what I'm watching is some of my students are doing even more on this planet than I can ever do. And that's a blessing. Well, you are a blessing. 
Thank you for coming. I will include the links in the yes, description yes. Uh, of the book and also of your monthly meeting. Yes, it's Thanks a circle so and it's the second, it's the second Saturday in every month. And they can contact me on my email. My email is reprogram your life. One word, reprogram your life at yahoo.com. And all they need to do is send me an email. And once they send me an email, I'll send the link. And it's absolutely great. free of charge. Well, great. I will include uh, the uh, email and also the link to your Please. book. Okay? Please, yes. Thanks a lot, Norma, once again. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Take it's care. It's been a pleasure to, to meet you and to speak with you and um, to send the blessings so that you're your journey, your spiritual journey can continue because there's always more to learn. Always more to learn. The more you learn, there's more to learn. This has been the AJ Parr Spiritual Journalist Podcast. Please like, share, and subscribe.